Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the panel that's going to be talking about uh, privacy by design practices in like the various organizations that are present on this conference in the call, but also, of course, in the sector as a whole. Uh, I'm Udhav Tiwari, and I'm a senior manager for global public policy at the Mozilla Corporation, uh, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. Before we kick off the discussion, I thought that we could just very quickly go around the room and have uh, the speakers introduce themselves. So, Utra, over to you to start off, and then please feel free to pass it on to the next speaker. Thanks, Udhav. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Uttara, and I lead public policy for Snapchat in India. Um, very nice to be here. Kailash, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, thanks, Udhav. I'm Kailash. I head technology at Zeroda. Uh, Zeroda is a stock broking firm. Thanks. Over to you, Sharin. Hello, Udhav. Hello, everyone. So this is Sharin Imani. I work as a privacy engineer at Zeta. Uh, great. Discussion uh, as well. Thank you. Cool. Uh, I just wanted to confirm, uh, Shelin, whether uh, uh, AVS Prabhakar would be joining us as well, because I know that he had said yes to the invite, but I'm not sure whether he's on the call. So I just thought I'd check with you since he's also from CETA. Yes, yes. Actually, he's traveling, so he won't be able to join us today. Okay, no worries. So I guess that we can have the conversation uh, with the folks like in the room. Um, I think that to like kick it off, uh, privacy by design, of course, as an idea is something that's been around for quite some time, but it's the recent spate of regulations, uh, starting with the GDPR in Europe uh, a couple of years ago, but even now in India with the data protection bill, that's really brought this concept to the fore as organizations of various sizes are thinking of how they can look at uh, ensuring that their practices, both when it comes to the designs of their applications and services, but also with internal practices with regard to how they deal with the data that they collect from, from these services uh, is as privacy preserving uh, as possible. And on the conversation today, we have organizations from sort of like a multitude of sectors, from like from the financial sector uh, to the social media sector uh, that I think uh, are all uh, uh, carry a wealth of experience with regard to both best practices internally, but also how they engage with the space uh, overall. So to kick the discussion off, I thought uh, we could start off with uh, Putra, you coming in and just firstly, gently talking about uh, SNAP's own experiences with, with both the concept of privacy as well as it sort of incorporates it uh, into its applications, but also um, how you see uh, both the sort of external environment when it comes to privacy regulation and how it's impacting uh, the development of apps and, and, and the provision of services uh, in the technology sector. Sure. Thanks, Subhav. Um you know, there's obviously a lot of complexity that you have to grapple with when considering questions of our privacy by design, right? And um, my learning from, you know, being at SNAP over the last nine months is that, uh, you know, it is important for us to come together as an ecosystem and delve into these questions. Um, frankly, to my mind, uh, a good sound privacy by design practice really, right, uh, is a design development process that considers sort of privacy and safety implications of new product features at the front end of the development process, right? That's that's what I've learned in the last nine months or so, being at Snap and, and learning from uh, colleagues and a company really that sort of prioritizes uh, privacy. Um, and it's not a post facto consideration essentially or merely a catchphrase to use in regulatory filings. I think privacy by design was sort of used a lot generally in, in, in sort of public policy parlance, right? But uh, to me, I think what I've really understood is that uh, it is sort of something that, that companies need to think about at the get-go, at, at the time of developing apps, at the, at the time of developing even new features, right? Uh, and it sort of sets a baseline to say, you know, if there's a particular update feature that does not pass this internal privacy review and you have detailed processes uh, to determine that, you don't launch that, right? Um, and I guess, you know, like, Another thing that I'd like to say is that sort of making specific design choices does inadvertently sort of throw up questions about a trade-off between uh, higher user engagement and privacy, especially if you're like a consumer facing company that is basically your, your advertising, your, your business model, for instance, is advertising based, right? And some companies, for instance, will, for instance, with Zero that's on this panel as well, Udhav, you're from Mozilla as well. Um, I think there is a, a way to make intentional choices that ensure that we tip that balance in the favor of privacy. Right. Uh, so, you know, sort of going into Snap a little bit, um, it was sort of, you know, a refreshing discovery for me how uh, sort of this privacy and safety by design practice and the data management practice was, was it was when, when it's practiced in earnest has such a powerful effect 
on preventing the types of failures that regulations like we're seeing the PDP bill, for instance, try to regulate for after the fact, right? Um, and so I guess, you know, a couple of things that I could talk about is uh, a, a couple of key principles, right? That seem to me as a sort of core to uh, uh, for sort of a, a privacy by design practice. Uh, first, as I said earlier, a privacy and legal compliance by design sort of framework, right? So all features are reviewed by a product attorney at the, and a privacy engineer before launch. Uh, second, sort of lim limited retention of data, right? So, for instance, if you want to target ads, you uh, sort of only if you you only sort of uh, create like a profile of a person uh, that is relevant to who they are today, and not have some sort of you know a, a decade long profile of them, right? For instance, at Snapchat, for instance, there is no PII based ad targeting, um, and people sort of, uh, the, the data is deleted as soon as it's been used, right? So there's no sort of long profile that you make of a person and then target ads towards them. Um, you don't use sensitive data, for instance, for uh, uh, targeting ads, right? And you limit the number of interest categories through which you um, target uh, an ad to a certain person. Uh, then, you know, sort of user controls and transparency also become an important factor. Uh, I think that sort of, you know, allowing users the option to opt out of third party data for targeting, uh, to see, you know, to allow users the option to see the kind of data that is collected about them. All of that, so for instance, is important. Then of course you can have incremental protections for children, for instance, say, saying that you won't target ads to them at all, uh, or, or you won't profile uh, children's data in any uh, manner or form. Um, so, you know, I guess that these are sort of broad principles that strike me as from a design perspective, and from a data management perspective, uh, sort of central to um, a, pri a private by design uh, experience, right? Um, so I'll stop there. And um, I, I guess the one thing I'll say in addition, just to answer the second part of your question is that, um, look, I, I do think that there are apps that are making these intentional choices with regards their design, with regards their data management practice. So when that is happening, a lot of thought is being put into uh, creating these apps. And I sort of talked about that trade-off between privacy and engagement, which sort of has an effect at the end of the day on the, on the kind of revenues that a company earns as well. So when that sort of long-term focus on privacy is taken, keeping in mind all of these other considerations, practical considerations, um, a law like the PT bill or other regulations as well, they sometimes seem to feel a little bit one size fits all, uh, because I think they're trying to regulate for the kinds of harms that you typically see in these large ubiquitous platforms. Right. And uh, perhaps, you know, the smaller companies are not always sort of creating those types of problems. In fact, perhaps they were designed keeping in mind the types of failures you're seeing in more broadly in the ecosystem. Um, and yeah, it, it definitely feels like companies of a size of, of Snap just sort of more medium sized. Uh, you know, it feels like we're ancillary damage and we, they're not the source of the problem, but we do get impacted by one size fits all regulations. Thank you. Uh, that was, I think, super, uh, like, I think, enlightening to be able to see both how uh, an international sort of company that has services in multiple jurisdictions, rather than necessarily using regulation as a motivating factor to, uh, you know, in order to design certain services, uh, like comes up with the concept of sort of principles uh, that that it ties to like built globally as well. It's something um, that we at Mozilla using the lean data practices framework that we've been talking about for quite some time and have worked pretty closely with HasGeekon as well. Uh, it's something that we've uh, tried to do as well. So like, and I'd be happy to sort of like talk about that a little bit later on in the conversation too. Um, but sort of moving from, I think that to uh, Kailash and Shalin, the both of you would maybe Kailash first, like the financial sector, as you can imagine, is one that, you know, is both I think that a lot of the regulation that the rest of the technology sector is really beginning to see now, the financial sector has had for a very, very long time. Um, uh, and uh, intrinsically, the relationship that financial players have with uh, their like their customers um, are also among the most sort of like important relationships, right? Because they're fundamentally relationships about about their, their financial investments, their money and, and, and various other things. So the term privacy in this case almost takes like a whole new dimension because of how sensitive this data is and and the uh, the power of of the relationship between um, service providers and consumers so could you talk a little bit about both zerodha's own approaches uh, that that it follows in designing its products but also uh, some trends that you generally see in the industry because over the last couple of years uh, you know we've seen a growth of this idea the concept of fintech in in a very expansive way and there are some practices that uh, even regulators like the reserve bank of india have started to you know like look into and and uh, regulate slash criticize in some instances as well. So your thoughts and opinions on those, but more importantly on Zerodha's own internal approach would, would be pretty welcome. Yeah, 
Uh, so we are in a bit of a peculiar spot here. So we are a stockbroker and uh, stockbrokers in the capital markets are not just regulated, but they are heavily regulated by multiple entities. So we are regulated by, I think, uh, five or six different entities, including SEBI, the apex regulator. So we have very strict regulations pertaining to absolutely every bit of information that we collect. So to give you an example, uh, web server HTTP access logs, we are mandated to store for three years. And users data, we are mandated to store for eight years. And every bit of information that we collect, all the do documents, scans, proofs, uh, signatures, we are mandated. So the whole idea of lean data doesn't apply here because we are mandated to collect humongous amounts of extremely sensitive data. So that is a whole different playing field. And if you look at uh, perhaps any broker or anybody, any entity in this ecosystem who's again uh, regulated by the same regulations, I don't think we are in a position to collect any more additional data because there's no additional data to collect. We collect absolutely everything as mandated by the law and regulations. So uh, the new th these new bills, uh, the new uh, draft, uh, privacy bill draft by the JPC, it prescribes, of course, it's an omnibus bill. Uh, you know, it has things, provisions for personal data, non-personal data, social media, media, I mean, all sorts of things. And it's a really complex bill to even decipher or understand. But if you dissect that, many of the provisions that are prescribed in this bill, we've already been following under you know, uh, our regulations. And I'm pretty sure the banking industry has similar, but a slightly different set of rules. So, Compliance is really a way of life here. Technology, app, data, these are all secondary. Compliance first, then you build whatever you want to build to fit into the regulatory compliance frame, framework. So in this industry, the way of thinking is entirely different. You know, It's flipped around. Now, I say this industry because FinTech is now an extremely broad, maybe even abused term. Uh, we are heavily regulated you know, financial technology players, but there are lots and lots of fintech apps uh, that just pop up and that are not regulated, uh, that operate in gray areas. Now, when it comes to privacy by design there, we've seen a very unfortunate trend of uh, certain kinds of fintech apps, especially ones that lend money, you know, unsecured, risky, collateral-less loans. Uh, infringing on all possible common sense first principle design, uh, ideas of you know privacy by design you know mining people's sms's or mining people's contacts to uh, to do dubious ways of profiling you know, pressuring people to to take out uh, let's say loans that they can't afford so when, unfortunately the word fintech has been shadowed by a spate of a huge number of such applications completely unregulated but the regulated side is you know uh, is made up of entities like uh, brokers and uh, banks so coming back to privacy by design as a product as i said there's no way to be lean as we are mandated to collect absolutely everything and the amount of data we collect in fact goes up every year there are new regulations that come up that ask us to collect even more data there are kycs there are rekycs there, there are video kycs and these have to be repeated regularly. That said, we still generate huge amounts of sensitive financial data. Uh, people who invest in trade with us, their transactions are recorded for at least eight years. So that, you know, there's this whole thing about data. Uh, you know, data is the new oil as the adage goes. Our product design philosophy uh, it's kind of the antithesis of that. Uh, we think that data in that sense, this whole data is the new oil adage is highly overrated. So uh, at Zerodha, we don't do any sort of profiling. We have huge amounts of data which we store uh, on behalf of our clients, but we never profile, we never extract behavior, we never use any of this data to uh, send recommendations or any sort of to push any sort of engagement. In fact, I'd like to call what we practice uh, user disengagement. So our philosophy is that you build a product, you offer, you offer a quality product, offer quality services, keep everything transparent. If people will like it, if people like it, they'll come use it. And 
we've been following this principle uh, since the very inception and over a decade it has worked out for us so we we can say with conviction that that model works you don't actually have to uh, mine people's data profile uh, people's data to offer them products or services or make a sustainable revenue people pay us to use the product we don't mine a profile their data so that is also possible and at zero that's the philosophy that uh, uh, we've adopted uh, since the very beginning despite storing mountains of you know financial data which a lot of people may say is valuable but as i said we think that is overrated in in many cases for many businesses there is no need to mine and extract value out of people's private and personal data it's just possible to offer quality products and services may not work in all industries but it definitely since we are specifically referring to fintech it definitely works in fintech and that's what has worked for us thank you i think that like both was a very interesting insight but also i think uh, a, like a very deliberate uh, example of what happens that just because you have a lot of data that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to utilize that data um, uh, in a particular way and that the sort of uh, in fact, like one of the things that uh, we even we at Mozilla, when we talk about the lean sort of data practices approach is essentially this, the first principle is really only collect the data that you necessarily need. And I think that uh, both because of regulation and of the kind of the sector you are, even though you end up collecting a lot of data, the follow on points, which are what are ways in which to utilize it in a way that respects user agency and, and is in their interest is clearly something that I think like uh, zero the practices in this case. And uh, I have a couple of follow up questions, but before sort of Really going into that, like uh, Sheldon, would you like to come in and talk about both Zeta's experiences um, uh, in the space as well as the, the in general the design of its products? Sure. So we are in the process of fabricating privacy into you know the culture at Zeta, and uh, more than that, the processes that we are following, be it business end or even uh, you know recommending things to the client. So we have been very cautious with that. And uh, also, while establishing the privacy governance structure at Zeta, we have been, uh, you know, very much, uh, you know, uh, we, we always made sure that there were the best sort of people who would manage privacy. And in terms of uh, handling the uh, procedures and uh, in terms of documenting things, everything was taken care of in a very uh, lucid manner. And in terms of, uh, uh, you know, user experience, right? If I were to speak about that, the front uh, facing, uh, the user facing applications, were always mandated that they are, uh, you know, uh, privacy compliant in terms of having a transparent, uh, you know, policy explaining to the user about how we are going to use that data, how, uh, you know, uh, Zeta is going to process that data and why are we processing that data? So things like that, we have been very much uh, peculiar about. And apart from that, uh, we also maintain a, a habit of having an inventory sort of thing, wherein we record all the personal data that is being stored or processed by Zeta, so that we can, uh, you know, in turn have a keen eye on the data fields that have been generated, and also, you know, uh, set the right set of controls for each and every field that's been generated out of Zeta. Yes. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, I mean, I think that like it's pretty clear that there are certain sort of like trends that are emerging from you know the the points that everyone's really raised, and uh, I think that one of the primary goals of this conversation is to really sort of like document some of these practices for the rest of the community, and I think that while people have given an overview of what some of those practices could really be, we could also talk about before really getting into some of the practices in detail, like uh, at least what people think of the current state. Uh, of these practices in in the Indian technology sector uh, as a whole, it's something that, for example, Kailash, you referred to uh, when you were speaking about other fintech apps, apps that are completely unregulated. You know, like deceptive design patterns and 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 how they're associated with with data collection as well. But um, uh, um, maybe Utra and, and Shalin, in, in, in that order, if you would like to sort of like talk a little bit about from your experiences, you know, as participants in this space, not necessarily as people representing your companies, uh, what do you feel about the state of practices uh, uh, in the ecosystem right now? What are the things that should be done in order to enable some of these practices to be adopted better? Um, and do you think that both the companies that are there in this room, but also otherwise organizations like Hasgi can play in making sure that those practices, you know, like uh, are are more commonly uh, adopted. So, Utra, would you like to go first? 
Yeah, no, I think that's um that's a great question, right? I think that you know from when I think about Snapchat, I think what's core to um, the app's design really is ephemerality. There's sort of a separation of social content from media content. So um, effectively, the part that there is no news feed, right? That, uh, you know, say my post as well as the news is all in one place. And then there's sort of like a, a public profile that people can sort of react to it and uh, have a public, a highly public conversation in, right? Um, if I'm honest, I feel like, you know, just, just as a user of the space, uh, again, you go back to this whole privacy versus engagement question, right? I think the fact that uh, some apps have open architectures, and I'm talking strictly about the social media space, is because there, it, you know, there's something about that design that is much more heady and, and sort of compelling and, have, and grabs the user's attention, right? And creates more engagement. Right, um, and I think that at the end of the day, uh, what are the incentives for an app to prioritize privacy over that engagement? Um, you know, I think we're now in a state where the debate on social media and and safety on social media has reached a tipping point, such that regulation is now coming to try to solve for that problem. Right, um, I think what's distinct about Snap, and this is again maybe a wrong too much corporate Kool Aid, but also really having noticed how the company has been sort of designed right from the start. Right, it was very intentionally designed as an antidote to social media. Right, it was sort of uh, it was from the learnings that hey, having this one feed where everybody puts you can see their their friends' contents as as well as um, you know the news, or or you can have a full record of everything you've said since you were like. 16 years old on a public profile, that sort of stuff was a big learning, right? In terms of this is not sort of privacy leaning. And everything about the app, right? From the ephemerality on chat and the fact that chat is separated from the part of the app where you can see the news. You know, we only work with, we have an old school method of, uh, of Discover, which is our news tab, which is basically you only work with like a publisher, right? And, and you have a contractual arrangement with them. So that sort of may, takes care of the fact that there's no, uh, you know, sort of, content other that is unlawful or sort of, of uh, not uh, of color in any way. Um, these types of choices to me were frankly prescient. Uh, I think that there is a while before, I don't know, you know, I, I often, I'd love to hear from other panelists as well and from you too, Bob, like in terms of uh, consumer demand for this, right? I mean, is there is there some, is there a, a growing momentum for, are, are, are we reaching the space yet where users feel like, hey, I no longer want an app to specifically target me. I don't want to be on an app where I'm being, where I'm performing for everybody. And uh, there are a massive incentive in terms of vanity metrics, for instance. And, you know, there, there's an entire culture around sort of the headiness of, more social apps, right? Which, which Snap, I think, is intentionally trying to steer away from. Uh, and I think that, I don't know, you know, I think that ultimately it's a, it's a matter of um, that, like, this is a long-term bet. You want users to ultimately choose your app because they find, they feel safer and they connect better on, on the app. And I think that, you know, if it's, it's, I think that the user base of Snapchat is kind of indicative of a shifting trend. Uh, we have mostly 13 to 25 year olds on Snapchat world over. You know, and that's telling us something about the way that younger people are preferring to communicate. Uh, and hopefully that's a trend that will stick, you know. So, yeah, like a bit of a ramble there. But really, I think that uh, I don't know the answer in terms of uh, user demand, that tipping point. Uh, but ultimately, right, like if, if companies are saying, hey, I, didn't, I don't mean to be this arbiter of big democratic questions or I don't mean to be an arbiter of free speech, uh, I think Snap has said, has sort of taken a different approach and said, listen, uh, we're just going to be a closed platform and we're not going to become a destination of these heady conversations in the first place that are causing the kind of harms that the regulation is trying to solve for. So yeah, I'll stop there. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, like I'm happy to also like sort of respond to a little bit because we definitely have some learnings on Mozilla's end in terms of the general demand for privacy and for more privacy preserving practices in the space. And we've sort of seen that reflected both in the usage of our own products, but also the kind of new products that consumers are asking organizations like Mozilla to create in the space as well. And I'm happy to get into that. But before going into that, Sharon, I really want to give you an opportunity to like same broader question that I'd asked Utra in terms of your views of practice in the space, um, as well as things that could be done to sort of improve them. As well. Yeah, so there's one point that I would like to raise here regarding the awareness of privacy in itself, of privacy as a practice that has to be followed by companies, as well as, uh, you know, in terms of understanding the different laws that are, you know, emerging, right? And uh, in terms of prioritizing that, 
and uh, seeing whether they are met in terms of compliance as well as in terms of uh, governance as well uh, at the company. And uh, also uh, hearing phrases nowadays like, uh, you know, data is the new oil and, uh, you know, uh, like uh, pri uh, keeping privacy in the center of user experience. Right. But uh, as more of more often that we hear that this is the era of big data, I feel that this is the era of privacy because uh, with emerging laws globally, right, uh, it's a very evident fact that we need to be, uh, you know, uh, responsible and held uh, accountable for the user's privacy and keep them at the center of uh, building things, right, and, uh, and keep embedding privacy into, the, into every phase of, uh, you know, developing products at uh, be it the you know uh, the uh, fintechs or be it the uh, social media companies wherever it is possible yeah thank you yeah um and i think that like uh, just to, I think, both take that point forward and, and cover the thing that I'd mentioned earlier. So even at Mozilla, like I think that, uh, for example, when we started talking about lean data practices with other organizations, which was now almost seven years ago, uh, but uh, even in general, when we first launched, uh, say, enhanced tracking protection, right, which was a way in which you could not like where Firefox was one of the first browsers that proactively blocked trackers and cookies from following you around the internet. Like uh, at that time, I think that there was interest, like you got media coverage, consumers you like those services but uh, if one were to compare say something like 2014 2013 which is when some of these things started happening to now there's a sea change uh, uh, in terms of both the demand from consumers for these services but also uh, how other players in the ecosystem like engage with them right uh, to give you an example uh, of say enhanced tracking protection the uh, of course the, the entities that this impacted the most tangibly were advertisers and website operators right because like advertising tends to be a source of revenue on on most websites on the internet but when they got into uh, like uh, in 2013 to 2014 like uh, there wasn't really a conversation it was more a, oh you're doing this okay it's fine you know it was the very similar approach to how people tended to view ad blockers at that time like that it was a minuscule fraction of the people who used to carry out those things and in and, and it's fine but now we've come to a scenario where of course firefox doesn't block advertising in any way at all but uh, but uh, but we do restrict how users are tracked by third party cookies across different websites now the conversation is quite radically different advertisers other browsers like chrome uh, are all really thinking about how to incorporate privacy preserving practices because they realize that there is a consumer demand for these things and now there are certain players in the space who are actually outliers for not providing those same privacy preserving practices that even you know just 5 years ago we were the outliers for providing them. Uh, uh, and, and just in the browser sector, whether one looks at Microsoft Edge, uh, uh, Apple Safari, Google's Chrome and us, like uh, almost all of them have some privacy preserving practices, but at least three of those four browsers have very clear privacy preserving practices that outlaw certain kinds of third party cookies, block trackers by default and do many other things, all of which have really happened in the last two to three years. And I think that that's fundamentally come from consumer demand of, of the idea that, uh, like I think post Cambridge Analytica in 2018, like the general awareness in society of some of these issues has expanded and it's not really stopped since then and, and regulation in many ways I think is like is is playing a similar role. Um, I do think, however, that like uh, that the sort of incentive structures and and this is something that we have spoken about in the past in terms of like you know is the business model of the web truly sustainable in the way that it works right now? And I think that uh, whether it's the broader venture capital sector, whether it's you know like the the notion or the idea that the only way to just to to uh, monetize users that you have is to do something with that data that ends up, you know, like either targeting them in a particular way or profiling them in a particular way um, is, is one that is slowly trickling down, uh, the, uh, like in, in even within the Indian sector, but like it still remains a little more the exception than necessarily the rule. Uh, and I think that organizations like Hasgeek and them carrying out measures that both make it easier for technical teams to be able to like understand how to bring these practices to their organizations, but also, uh, engage in the policy conversations themselves right because th th there is a i think mixture between the both of them that that's really important to make sure that they, they that they become more sustainable in the long term and i think that that's uh yeah like that's something that we've both been engaging with and have been a part of but also like i think are uh, really hoping to see scale in india over the next couple uh like coming years because it's it's something that's uh ends up being pretty important so uh so with that i think that like now that we broadly covered indians it, like 
organizational overviews and 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 what we think of the indian space i thought that we could spend some time maybe in particular talking about some of these uh, practices right like while i think all of us have mentioned that in passing like kailash maybe starting with you like imagine that you were talking to a room of developers like from the uh, like you know from the space and you were you and you had to tell them uh, here are certain practices that you should keep in mind uh, when you're thinking about the idea of privacy by design what would those ideas concepts principles be that that you'd like to sort of get across to them i'm uh, you could of course rely on a little bit on the guide that has geek has put together but even independent um, of that like from your own experience of running um, a, a tech team uh, in uh, you know like a successful fintech startup like what would you say uh, i think more than technical measures which we can just google and figure out it really comes down to this, the culture and philosophies that power run a business so to give you a concrete example we have this uh, only on a need to know basis philosophy so we have a large number of you know support agents who pick up phone calls and answer customer queries so they need to look up information on uh, customers who are calling now if there is a broad look up form it's possible for anyone to look up anyone's information so by design we restricted it in such a way that we have field level permission so irrespective of who someone is irrespective you no know, by virtue of position in our company somebody does not just get access to like a super admin dashboard where you can do everything so for that you have to have the top management uh, on board if you know if your c cxos demand that they need access then there's no point in discussing technical measures because everything will trickle down to not be privacy friendly at all so it's very cultural so that was one concrete example no matter what dashboard that we build what reporting system we build what customer support do we build it's only given to people who really need to use it and within those dashboards and screens and views people only really need to people only get to see what they're supposed to look at so field level permissions uh, there's no place where somebody uh, we have a thousand plus people so there's no place where all people can just log in and you know start pulling data now this simple thing you know people only get to see uh, what they meant to see trickles down across all departments across dozens if not maybe like a hundred systems and that gets incorporated uh, technically from access control to uh, field control to access audit logs to alerts that throw up an alert if somebody's you know uh, some certain information bit of information is being pulled uh, more than whatever an expected uh, number of times so that just that principle now has expanded to dozens of technical practices and this again this this whole idea also gets embedded into uh systems development when you write software so we have a trading platform which uh which is used by it's a millions of people every day then there are these massive databases where data goes in sets you know the data that people generate their trades their history so these are entirely separate they sit on separate networks they don't have access to each other uh developers who work on let's say the trading platform have no access to systems that do the number crunching and just that that's incorporated right into network design there's no physical access there's no connectivity between these two systems and if they if these two completely different systems need to speak to each other uh, it's defined in a spec somewhere a certain api very restricted limited connectivity is created it goes through a gateway so just because there's zeroda and zeroda has six products and they all are integrated into with each other uh, does not mean that all of them sit inside let's say one network so this whole idea of an application a person should only see what they're supposed to see similarly a piece of software that we write should only be able to access what it truly needs to access everything else is closed off by design so that i think that's all that's all i have to cite really that philosophy then manifests in many different uh, technical manners practices across all sorts of systems networks people business processes absolutely everything 
Thank you. And I think that like, uh, if I could just like sort of add to that, I think that even historically, like, that's very much been the case, uh, uh, even at Mozilla, like way from the beginning of that project in 2004, like there were ideas, like, it took us, I think, close to a decade to be able to start collecting very basic telemetry about users, you know, like, how many errors are users facing, because there was a lot of resistance internally to the idea of us collect, like, in fact, the lean data practices were developed as a way to um, make internal stakeholders understand that when Mozilla would deal with data, it would deal with it in this way, so it could start beginning to sort of collect that. And I think that philosophical approach has really um, helped us navigate a lot of our conversations uh, in the space over the last couple of years um, in a far simpler way than I think many of our peers and competitors have had to, because for us, some of those answers that are complicated for others are quite simple if you follow certain core, core principle and cultural tenets with regard to how um, they, they should be implemented. Um, uh, Sheldon, would you like to come in here in, in terms of like, if there were pra either practices or principles or outlooks that, that you'd had to share with the space, what would they be? Yeah. So the very first thing that came to my mind was the uh, one that Kailash said, the role-based access controls, actually. And apart from that, uh, I would like to uh, bring upon two things. That is, one is uh, data minimization, of course, because, uh, the min uh, you know, uh, data minimization is the key uh, way in, in order to limit the uh, you know, uh, limit the possibility of data getting breached, right, or a privacy breach. So the lesser the data that you collect, the lesser there is a possibility of having a breach. That is one thing that I'll tell the developer for sure. And the next thing is about the cookies that are being, you know, procured on the apps. And uh, that is something that is handled by developers. So they need to be really uh, sure as to what each cookie does, because uh, there are cookie policies being followed by companies and uh, with state that there is a certain cookie doing a certain task, a third party cookie or, or essential cookies for that matter. So that needs to be transparent enough and being uh, communicated to the users, uh, you know, very specifically. Uh, I, I, what I feel is uh, to be very honest that that uh, awareness is a little less in, uh, in terms of the Indian region, but whereas, uh, you know, in the international level, it's, uh, it's much talked about and, and it's taken very seriously. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Utra, any, anything for uh, on your end that you'd like to sort of add? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I sort of already talked about this a little bit. Firstly, fully concur both with Sherlin as well as Kailash, right? I mean, there is very much, a, it has to be intentional and it has to be something that sort of permeates the entire organizational process, right? There should be a culture of privacy within the entity. Uh, from a SNAP perspective, what are some lessons? I think Again, right? And this is perhaps more uh, relevant for folks that are in the in the social space. But in a sense, you know, each of the tabs on the Snapchat app have a lesson to offer. On the chat side, for instance, there's ephemerality uh, and the fact that you know folks need to add each other mutually in order to communicate, right? It's not, it's not if someone can just send you a random message and there's no like others holder, for instance. Uh, then we have a thing called Maps. Maps is private by default. That to me again is a user control that allows people to protect themselves and only you know, to sort of turn it on and put themselves on the map if they want to, right? Um, and then, as I said earlier, the, the discover, the, the part, the news part of the app, as well as the entertainment part of the app is completely separated from these two functions, which again sort of enhances privacy, right? Uh, so these intentional app design choices, you know, combined with the data management practices that Sherlin talked about as well. For instance, we have a data minimization practice, we, we delete by default, uh, and we also have super short retention periods, right, uh, for uh, data. And also, again, a, a way of targeting ads that does not use PI, does not sort of allow individual level targeting. So all of these together, right, I think overall make the app a much safer and much more private uh, app for users than, you know, say sort of more open platform. So these to me are some powerful um, features that perhaps are useful for other types of use cases and other types of apps as well. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I mean, and there, like in terms of some practices that I think I'd like, I'd be happy to sort of add as well, at least uh, within Mozilla, one of the things that we tend to view with regard to user data uh, is that, that uh, as much as possible, uh, and of course, unless there are like regulatory requirements around it, uh, try not having access to that data in the first place, right? Like, so as an example, um, browsing data on Firefox is end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that uh, it's synced between different instances of Firefox when they come online and actually doesn't reside in a centralized server somewhere. So that's not to say Mozilla doesn't have a copy of your browsing data. We completely do because that's where it's synced from, but it's 
encrypted by keys that are actually only present on the devices uh, that that user has used to, to log in uh, to that account. And, and the thinking behind that philosophy is that as a browser, we believe that browsing data is among the most sensitive uh, concepts with which, um, that, with which our users trust us. And we definitely wanted to give them the convenience of having it, you know, between their mobile phone or their tablets and, and their uh, laptop or desktop installations synchronized. So they didn't have to like, you know, do it all over again whenever they set up a new device. Um, but we decided that it was not something that we wanted to be make, make directly available to ourselves uh, at the same time as well. Um, and um, when it and uh, Firefox, for example, also does rely on uh, advertising as a part of some of its revenue as well. So within Firefox's main uh, new tab that one opens up within the browser, there are certain tiles on that new tab that are sponsored. That you know that like. Uh, different players can uh, either bid to be a part of or sometimes are directly synchronized with advertising servers. Uh, but none of that data uh, is essentially shared directly with, with advertisers. It's either processing that happens on the device of the user, so it never really is even available to a third party. And if it is available to a third party, it goes through um, a proxy server where Mozilla sort of, you know, like even doesn't even share the IP address from which that request from that ad is coming from with the advertiser. It's it's Mozilla operates a proxy server that sort of takes that information in, removes identifying information, shares that with like individuals who would like to show the ad, processes it back, and then sends that same proxy server sends it back uh, uh, to to the installation of the computer, right? And I think that some of these practices are, are practices that even within Mozilla we have definitely gotten more comfortable with the idea of of dealing with data of of you know like of of business models and of and of preserving privacy and it's very much like I would say an ongoing process. Uh, so it, um, it's very easy, I think, for for many players in the space to be like completely privacy maximalist and say like we will never connect data and like and we will never do anything in in a particular way. But I think that at Mozilla, one of the things that uh, at least I personally feel like sets us apart a little bit in the space is that um, uh, we try to be both more constructive and come up with solutions to the privacy problems that that you know like uh, are created because of the dealing with this data rather than completely not uh, necessarily touching the data at all but also in cases like I described with that end-to-end -end encryption sync which is that for certain extremely sensitive pieces of data like building in technical protections that make sure that even we uh, are never able in in, in practice uh, to be able to access it and I think that um, in general that sort of thing like it's it, uh, I think firstly awareness about some of that kind of thinking in, in the space in India is is pretty important because um, I think that, you know, generally in um, whether it's in the Silicon Valley culture or whether it's uh, in Europe with laws like the GDPR, like the sort of gestation period for some of this awareness has actually been 15 years, 20 years, like not everyone always thought this way. And a lot of this thinking is very, very new. And I think that um, the fact that our technology sector is growing to the extent that it is recently uh, makes it more imperative that some of this awareness is as readily available to the rest of the space um, uh, as possible uh, as well. So in general, just sort of like keeping an eye a little bit on time as well. I think that we had counted broadly for about 50 minutes for this uh, conversation. I like uh, thought that either I could sort of go into a little like ask follow-up questions to the things that folks have asked uh, said, or uh, we could use uh, the last like four odd minutes uh, like in case folks had closing remarks, things that, you know, they wanted to either react to each other in terms of things that have been said in the conversation so far or wanted to make points that they haven't really gotten an opportunity um, to do so far. So, uh, Shelin, I thought that I could start with you. And if you wanted to sort of like come in, um, anything that like you think hasn't been covered or responses to anything either I've said or, or any of the other speakers uh, have said as well. Yeah. So, firstly, I would like to thank HasGeek for making me be part of this uh, you know, panel discussion with, uh, you know, all of y'all feels a little intimidating for me as well sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one thing that I would like, uh, you know, has geek to do, in fact, is, uh, you know, uh, raise awareness in terms of privacy engineering and, uh, you know, privacy enhancing technologies, because uh, I, I did a little research on, you know, uh, privacy enhancing technologies and uh, how we can, you know, learn privacy engineering. So all of that is either, uh, you know, it's from Carnegie Mellon University or either it's from some other university across the globe, but not from India. So I think uh, that has to be brought in. A culture of privacy has to be brought in. Yeah, I would like to end with that note. Thank you. Thank you. Utra? Um, yeah, no real um, new thoughts to add. I think, again, congratulations to Hasgeek and to Mozilla on these, on these new initiatives. Um, 
you know, I think one important gap, and I, I think the team at Mozilla is, is at Tehaski is here as well, is that, um, you know, there seems to be regulatory activity that's developing at a frenetic pace in India. There's lots happening almost on a weekly basis. There's a new announcement, and I think a bunch of us are scrambling to respond meaningfully to policy. Um, I think it's um, critical that sort of, you know, these conversations in this community, very excited, by the way, to be on a, on a panel with a privacy engineer and a chief technology officer. Don't know how I got here. Uh, but I think that it's important for there to be a bridge between the tech community and the, the policy community, in a sense, and, and to actually take these suggestions right back to regulators, right? Because uh, for several reasons, um, the, the policy landscape, of course, is is in somewhat, in some ways, quite politically charged, but it's also sort of not allowing the space for uh, legitimate conversations around design, for instance, to make its way to government corridors, right? So, yeah, you know, I'm I'm sort of eager for there to be more thinking around how that gap can be bridged, uh, and for you know the policy making in general to. Uh, be a bit more evolved, right, and sort of uh, source itself from problem statements that 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 and from solutions that you know come from people like yourselves and like more folks in uh, in tech that can speak to these from a design perspective or a data management perspective, as opposed to uh, as opposed to it being framed in sort of the antagonistic way that we sometimes see that it is at the moment. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Kailash. Anything to add? Yeah, a couple of things. You uh, earlier asked about the state of uh, practices around us. I think the state is absolutely abysmal. So these large-scale policy interventions and activity, practically starting with GDPR, these are all these are all reactionary. So the extent of abuse and extraction, exploitation of data and private data, it reached a tipping point. That is when governments and regulators suddenly woke up, and you can't really blame policymakers because of the because the extent of uh, exploitation has been seismic galactic really some of the biggest most lucratively profitable corporations on the planet uh, make their money by extracting and exploiting data and many of these new uh, practices etc have been institutionalized into uh, I know they've been given like a humane varnish. We can humanely collect and monetize private data. I think there, there are deeply philosophical questions here. And I think technological solutions to privacy problems uh, are most likely band-aids. And I can cite an example, which is the cookie pop-up. Now, half the sites on the planet are plagued by dark pattern cookie pop-ups. There's a Yes, I agree button. Then there's a customize my really complex query preferences button. So the GDPR regulations intended for a simple yes, no, but that's not what's happened. So the prescription of very specific technological measures to mitigate non-binary complexities when it comes to privacy. And these are not technological problems, right? It's not a cookie problem. It's that uh, organizations use cookies as a means to, I don't know, track. So prescription of very specific problems most likely and often are highly ineffective. What they do is they make user experience for the end users even more complicated and tedious. Now, when somebody sees a cookie pop, they don't understand what it is. They hit yes. And suddenly they've legally consented to being tracked. It's probably slightly worse than before. So there are all these really unintended consequences with extremely specific technological measures prescribed by policymakers. And we also see this in our industry when our regulators come up with very specific technological fixes for human slash stock market problems. They're often, they, they make it worse for everyone, you know, increase the compliance burden, make it difficult to implement and make it, uh, they make an entire bunch of things really difficult for end users. So yes, we need really strong policies, but my view is, and, and, uh, from my experience of having worked in this and from my observations over the last many years, very specific uh, policymakers should ideally stay away from very specific technological uh, rec recommendations. And it should be on a principle basis. I, I use that word because SEBI, the capital markets regulator, they have this very interesting uh, concept where they publish uh, 
circulars and they use the word sorry in spirit so the circular may not very specifically prescribe a technical measure sometimes they do but most often they don't but in spirit they have certain things laid out and if you don't follow that in spirit and they can figure out then you're in trouble you can't say that oh you didn't ask us to show a pop up but they you know in spirit do not collect private data or do not set cookies whatever uh, so these regulations technology slash privacy regulations i believe should be in spirit and the implementation should be uh, left to broad industry discussion and like utra said there's just so much activity and there are so many specific extremely specific technological prescriptions that are coming through i think that is just going to complicate things and probably have really bad unintended consequences so policy technological policy making absolutely requires hands on technological expertise and regulators who are not hands on technical should work hand in hand with you know people who get technology uh, the industry and i'd like to cite one last example 2018 sebi came up with this very comprehensive cyber security circular for the whole industry and they just published a draft for review and it had many infeasible highly non technical things and it was clear that you know they didn't really have a technical capacity to prescribe very specific things so we wrote back to them and sebi was highly receptive so in fact sebi created an industry plus regulatory committee to sit and write the individual points in the cyber security circular together sebi so accepted that they didn't have the technical expertise so they welcomed people with and it was a and over a few months we co-wrote the industry you know, technical folks from the industry sat with sebi in sebi's offices and co-authored and you know it was reviewed passed through many stages and it became law for the whole industry so that was great that was holistic regulation making by a, a really powerful big regulator and i think more regulators uh, policy makers government should take that approach rather than bombard the industry with high technical measures they should sit with technical experts and come up with holistic uh, regulations sorry that was a rant but yeah thank you no not at all kalash thank you so much and i think that it's also um, something that uh, like folks in the let's just say the policy side because uh, i mean i i know that i've had many of these conversations with utra as well is is something that we've been asking for for a very long time in the space as well and i think that um uh, the on it i wouldn't say the trouble but the issue uh, with sort of you know like very broad horizontal laws like a data protection law or an it act uh, is that the sort of um, the political impetus behind who speaks who doesn't speak who's a part of the committee who's not a part of the committee who the law will impact who the law will not impact the timelines in which it will operate are all um, end up being so complex that uh, at its core there is uh, uh, that representation that you mentioned of you know like for example when india's first data protection bill was like you know that first draft came out in 2018 uh, yeah it had people from nascom people from the data security council of india people who were supposed to be the voice of of the industry but um, the influence that the industry has in all processes since then and the law you know like like i would say argue 25 to 25% of it has changed in all its four iterations and now it's almost a radically different law in comparison to what really started off um, and um, it's the ability to follow through to make sure that the technical expertise is readily available to government stakeholders whenever it's necessary but also from the government uh, a willingness to engage uh, in that format is something that i like just from the example that you've spoken about i think from the sebi is definitely something i think many other regulators both uh, sectoral as well as horizontal uh, could definitely learn from uh, as well and thank you so much for sharing um, that experience because i think even from within the technical community who may see this conversation uh, it's i i think uh, a motivating impetus to you know like reach out to regulators not just treat things that regulators give out as it's that this is now going to become law but to share feedback to to be constructive and to attempt to shape things in a manner that you know end up uh, benefiting not just themselves but um, everyone else in the space um, as well so yeah thank you so much for sharing that but i think that with that like we are now coming close uh, to a close uh, in the conversation as well thank you so much kailash utra and shalin for like sharing your thoughts it's been uh, very exciting and uh, thank you so much to hasgeek for organizing uh, the conversation as well so um, wherever you are have a good uh, day morning or night goodbye